Man, Damon. Happy Monday, dude. We're ready to go this week, man. Hey, look at Dan Biggers already <laughs> ready and waiting. Hey, did you see Dan was somehow shaving his head over the weekend? Did you catch that? He was, you know, Dan, come on, dude. Just do it, man. Just be a man. And, and sh- all right, Damon, are you sitting down for this one? Are you? I'm are you ready. Sitting? Are you ready? Because guess what? Here we go. We've got Coach Khan in the house. Khan, dude, it's been so long overdue. Happy Monday. How are you, my friend? Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you guys. Love being here. We are way overdue, brother. We are way oh. overdue. Well, man, I tell you, I, I've, oh my gosh, we got so much to talk about. I'm, you know what, Damon, I'm not even pulling any punches. I'm going to, I'm just, I'm going right for it. You ready? Are you? Go right in. Go I'm right going, in. I'm, Let's do it. I'm, we're diving right in the deep end, man. There's no like, you know, okay. Khan, we have a ton to talk about. Dude, you're international author, speaker, award-winning coach. You've got a new book coming out. You had a book. I was with you, brother, when you came out with your book during COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I became fast friends with you. My admiration and respect for you off the charts. We have so much juicy things to talk about. My first question for you is a mm-hmm. little guy growing up. Mm-hmm. When you were a little guy growing up, who <laughs> was your hero? Who Ooh. was your hero as a little guy growing up? Um, who was my hero? Well, first of all, uh, I had tremendous respect and love for my father. Um, and little did I know at the time how much he had to overcome to accomplish what he did mm. and do what he did. And this is um, one of those really, really powerful rags to um, raising a family kind of story, the immigrant story. And um, I just had no idea, man, how much my father had to overcome to get there until growing up, I left and came back and reconnected with him as an adult. But I just loved my father. He was my inspiration, my role model in so many ways. And he's influenced me in um, in in many, many ways. I mean, my my desire to help others, my desire to be of service, my desire to to work hard and kind of put my head down and get things done. Um, not the flashy, but the substantive. That was what he was all about. Yeah. Well, all right. Not the flashy. No I surprise like whatsoever. Con, what was your father's name, please? His name is the equivalent of Michael in English. So his name was Michalis, which in Greek translates to Michael. Michael. All right. Well, hey, big shout out to Michael. Now, were you born in Greece? I was not. So my, I, I've got that interesting, unique thing of being born to first generation immigrants in Australia. So my parents immigrated there back in the 60s to basically look for a better life when the, mm. the country was inviting workers into their factories and into a lot of their manufacturing plants. Nice. Um, so my parents went there, they got married, and I was born there along with one of my sisters. But then, like many immigrants, they had that desire, that pull back to their homeland. So at some point, when I while I was still young, they went back. So I have all of my formative years then finished school, finished my college, my military service, started working. All of that, those experience were in Greece. So I relate a lot to Greece as being my homeland. But then I got to taste what it was like for my parents coming to the States as a first generation immigrant myself with my wife. My wife is from the U.S. and we fell in love. We were working together um, abroad and we... We decided to get married, and uh, we came to the States. This is a tremendous land of opportunity, and um, most people don't even realize how good it is here. We complain about a lot of things, man, but (laughs) unless you've lived and worked other places, I've traveled and worked on four different continents, I can guarantee you this is still the land of opportunity. Well, all right, man. We're just getting things started, man. Yeah. Hey, we got a few people dropping some hellos here, guys. Happy Monday I'm to done. you. Hello. You're out there. Drop us a note. Let us know that you're here. And boy, yeah. do yourself a favor. Connect with Khan here on LinkedIn. He puts out all sorts of inspirational information. He's coming out with a brand new book that we're going to be diving into. We're going to be talking about Fresh Biz Solutions. He does all sorts of uh, workshops, speaking Con, before we go there, dude, you're talking about meeting your wife now. When I became, you know, as I met you, and again, just absolutely love what you've got going on here. And we've got another friend here, Evan from Cincinnati. Oh, Yvonne. I'm sorry, Yvonne. Yvonne. Man, Yvonne, happy Monday to you. Thanks for joining us here. we got another friend here. So, Con, five years on Carnival Cruise. Do I have that correct? Five well, years. it felt that way. It was a little less than that, but it was close. It was close to that. So, I brought out with my wife, we were bringing out the brand new ships um, from the yards that they were built in Helsinki in Finland. 
yeah. all the way out of the wrappers and starting up their process, starting up their routes, brand new ships. Now it's funny because 30 years later, my wife and I just went on a cruise in December back on Carnival yeah. Yeah. after 30 years since we worked there. And we went on what was considered, you know, a fairly large ship. Um, and it just felt tiny compared to some of these others that are out there. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at it going, I can't believe this. But we were serving at the time. I mean, there were 70,000 tons of ship, 2,500 guests on board every week, and 1,000 crew. That seemed like a lot. Yeah. Nowadays, you can double or triple that almost. Yeah. Gosh, isn't that crazy? So, hey, we got a few more people dropping notes. We've got Eric from Dallas. Eric, happy Monday. We've got Patrick in the Thank house. You. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. Brian. Hey, Brian Fleming from Detroit's here today. Brian. And Dan says, I approved that message. Connect with Con <laughs> for that. sure. Con, what was it like? We we're gonna be we're gonna dive into inspiration, your leadership expertise. Mm -hmm. Before we go there, just curious minds would love to know what was it like being on a cruise ship? Just talk a little bit about you know yeah. all the world the world you traveled. Let's hear a little bit about that. Well, let me put it this way: time and time changes when you're working on a cruise ship. Uh, it's a very different experience because you are um, literally on 24-7 because at any given moment, somebody can come knocking on your door, even if you're not scheduled, and say, hey, somebody got sick, somebody's got hurt, somebody needs help, we need you out there. What are you going to do? I mean, you, there's nowhere to go. It's not oh, like, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, you can't really call in like, hey, I'm yeah. running late, I've got traffic. <clears throat> where, on the stairwell? Going yeah, up to right. I mean, yeah. Where? yeah. So you are basically there and you are on, and time is it changes things. The relationships that you have with people are so much more accentuated because you are in that 24 seven world. I mean, when my wife and I met, we talked about that extensively, you know, we started dating, we started seeing each other, but you know, the first six months felt like it was three years of, of being together because it's not like on land where you can, I'll see you next week. I'll see you in a few days. You, your cabins are like two doors down. So it's like, yeah, where are you going to go? So everything is compounded and there is a different focus on things. So it, Everything is accentuated. It's like you're living in this bubble. But at the same time, there are little things that you start losing track of time. And, you know, one week rolls into the next, into the next, into the next. And you're turning things around. And the faces, you know, you start losing track of that. Unless you pay attention, unless you're very mindful yeah. to stay in the moment, it's very easy to lose track. But I can tell you, my contracts were nine and a half months long. And being in that kind of environment for that long, my friend, it really you start understanding what it's like to feel that pressure and get into that cabin fever mode. By the end of the, my contract towards the end, I have to be honest, man. I just, I just did not want to be around people beyond. I just find some quiet spaces to just go and kind of relax a little bit because it was just too much. Yeah. Yeah. How about, yeah. uh, and, and we're going to die. I'm going to segue into leadership from there. Any favorite places, favorite <laughs> spots, any, any, uh, you know, herring, uh, uh, you know, terrifying events that occurred on your on your excursions or anything like that i have to admit that you know we didn't have i mean there's so many stories out there that go on about cruise ships and everything else i have to admit we were very very fortunate mm -hmm. we experienced some amazing things i mean especially at young age you know being able to go places where you know normally on my you know checking account i couldn't afford to be there in yeah, those yeah. kind of places so being able to work and travel i mean that is a tremendous education yeah. going to places throughout the caribbean eastern western caribbean south america i mean being able to do that and coming from a country that is renowned for its tourism and hospitality from greece where you know for us it's one of our top industries yeah. um it was very much appreciating what was there the similarities, but also the major differences between, you know, many of the beautifully natural places in the Caribbean versus a lot of the natural beauty that my homeland of Greece has, but there's also a rich history as archaeology. There's so many other things that go with it and being able to compare and contrast and appreciate each one for what it was. That's amazing, man. And looking at what um, industry could do to a place. I mean, let's, let's kind of bring it home a little bit to our audience here. When you think about <clears throat> the opportunities that an industry can bring to uh, a place that otherwise would struggle from for its economic viability. When you're bringing an industry that can employ people, that can give them opportunities, that's a tremendous boon. Right. I mean, no matter what you say, there are, you know, companies are smart. They're going to look for places where they can make money. Yeah. But 
it's also an opportunity for the communities that they go into to be able to partner with them. And as long as you can work with people, there is a good, there you're, you're negotiating from a place of trust, of mutual respect, mm-hmm. of willingness to work together. So many good things can come out of that, brother. Well, gosh, absolutely love this. All right, hey, we've got David Ray from Montreal. Hey, David, David, happy Monday to you. Dan, hey, look, our Kurt Anderson coach, Con, is <laughs> looking to take the moniker. Hey, Con is Mr. <laughs> Worldwide, man. I, yeah. I, I pull no punches here on this stage. Khan, let's slide into this. So uh, we're talking to, if you're just joining us, boy, check out Khan on LinkedIn. He has a lot of exciting things going on. Yep. We're going to be talking about a new book that he's just uh, putting out uh, this month. You guys heard it here. You've been, we've been talking about it, but we'll see yep. you first. But Khan, when you're on that cruise ship and uh, going through that early stage of your career, were you starting mm-hmm. to sense like that there was a calling or like what, what did, where did you find that inspiration of leadership of like, you know, really that, that this was going to be how you make the world a better place, helping people be better leaders. When did, when your career did that start hitting you? I have to admit it was a lot earlier than that. Um, Mm -hmm. in many ways, uh, I'm a firstborn. And so many times firstborns are thrust into, um, that kind of role, especially when they have younger siblings, um, with my father having to work many hours be, you know, sometimes he traveled between Greece and Australia to go and work for, three to six months to make enough money to pay for our tickets to go join him. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to be from a very young age. I remember like nine years old or 10, my father turning and saying, you know, you're the man of the house now. You have to help and take care. And so at nine years old, I went into my local grocery store and asked if I could sweep floors just to be able to help my family. Because, you know, sometimes you don't realize how how economically deprived or poor you might be until you leave the house. Yeah. And so I look for those things and I never forget my roots. I mean, my parents did the best that they could with what they had with a third, fourth, fifth grade education growing up in the end of the tail end of the second world war in Greece, where the country was literally destroyed and had to come back from its ashes. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are, these are stories that I look at that and it's not about the fact that my father perhaps didn't make, you know, millions of dollars or doing that. My father was somebody who taught me what class was, mm-hmm. even with somebody who could barely write his name. Mm-hmm. And that had nothing to do with his education or his income or anything else. Mm-hmm. It was his heart. And so it thrust me in a situation very early on to take on that leadership mantle and be responsible for others. I mean, I served in the military. I went into the military, which for Greeks, uh, Greek males is a, is a mandatory thing. And at the time it was two years. Well, I served as a, as a drill instructor, as a, as a sergeant. And so I had responsibility for a platoon of men very early on mm-hmm. and being able to train people to take them through those responsibilities. And throughout every part of my job, I've always gravitated towards leadership roles, not because I wanted to be in the spotlight, but because I felt the calling to serve and support others and to improve things, to make things better, to always constantly look for what can we tweak? What can we adjust? What can we even go against the grain and create some breakthrough results from this? I did it in the military. I did it in the private sector. I did it when I worked for companies that had a hundred thousand employees spread over a hundred countries mm-hmm. and I did it for private companies. Mm-hmm. So my entire track record has been all about that. How can we make things better? How can we get the most, how can we win the hearts and minds of our people and get the most out of our systems and processes? Wow. Okay. Damon, there's our, our first drop the mic with, with yep. coach Khan right there. Yep. So all right. Yep, we'll drop the mic moment. Man, was that all right, guys? If there's a takeaway there, heart boy, just you know, talk about Khan's father being such an inspiration and the heart that he showed. And Khan, I just love the humility that you're talking here about just being that servant leader. And you know, again, my respect and admiration for you and our friendship. Hey, a couple of folks are dropping notes here. We've got Alan, happy Monday to you, my friend. And boy, we've got a great yeah. conversation going on, Alan. Thank you. David has a comment here. Well said. When I was younger, my grandfather always told me I had a roof over my head, shoes on my feet, food in my stomach. I was rich. David, thank mm-hmm. you, man. Your grandfather was a very wise man. Yvonne mm-hmm. says the first child is always the survivor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, yeah. Great comment there. Con, all right. So let's go in here. So uh, guys, again, if you're just popping in, please co- uh, connect with Coach Khan on LinkedIn. All sorts of great stuff. 
We're going to be diving in. Got a great book. And also, you, if you look, when you connect with Khan, I want you to admire his headline here. Helping organizations develop leaders that will make your business plans a reality. So guys, hang mm-hmm. tight because we're going to be diving into this. Khan, what inspired you and your wife to come back to the States? So you've traveled all over, you know, you grew up in Greece served in the military, served, you know, traveled the worldwide. Uh, what brought you back to the States and what was that like for you, those first steps? So when my wife and I got married, um, we got married in Greece and we were planning on kind of starting our initial steps there. Uh, I have to admit that, you know, not even comparing it to now 30 years later, but my English even at the time was better than my wife's Greek. And so, you know, it was one of those things where I felt, again, I wanted her to be, comfortable. I wanted her to be happy. I wanted her to be in a good place. And so our decision was that, you know, we still don't have anything definitive here in Greece to, to, to kind of transition into. The economy was not the greatest. I mean, it was pre a lot of the, the, the rough, you know, austerity measures, but still um, it wasn't a great opportunity. And you know, we were at a time where it felt it felt right to come to the States mm-hmm. and really look for that next level, that next transition and seek those opportunities out. And so I told her, I said, you know, if we can't be close to my family, might as well come and be close to yours. Mm-hmm. And at the time, most of our family, almost all of it was here located in Denver, Colorado. Mm-hmm. So this is where we planted our roots and built our home. And this has been our, our place uh, for the last 30 years almost. I mean, so we've been we've been here since 1996. And really, really, I've come to appreciate this beautiful state that I live in, this beautiful country that I live in, and the place where I call home. And so to me, you know, I've traveled throughout the U.S. with my work, and with, and I've been very blessed, and I've seen many, many beautiful places. But still, I put Colorado right up there. Nice. I'm nice. with you there. All right, Con. So let's start diving in. So you get uh, come back to the states. You get settled in. Let's start diving into your career. And I love to, for as you described this, I love to kind of tie in like these leadership moments that you started seeing, whether good, bad, the ugly. Where were there mm-hmm. opportunities for improvement, or maybe mentors that you came in along the way were like, boy, I really want to follow this woman, this guy, and mm-hmm. I like what they're doing. So t- let's go through a little bit of like your career tied in with your leadership journey uh, in your in your younger days. Well, when I came to the States, I mean, there was, there was a lot of questions about what what, could, what would I do? Mm-hmm. And um, so when I started out, one of the, you know, back in those days, I still picked up a newspaper, opened it up and was looking for job openings. Yeah. You know, I came here, we arrived just before Christmas 96. And I had the responsibility of making sure that I did my part for our family with my wife and making sure that I was out there hustling, looking for my next job. Mm-hmm. Well, <sighs> For many reasons, I wasn't going to keep doing what I was doing prior to that. So I was looking for something different. I was looking for a change. And in the current environment, I found a job opening in a call center of all things. And they were it was a travel agency, basically, but a membership travel agency. Back in those days, if you remember, the big call centers, the big cube farms, and mm-hmm. having all of these different subscription services for shopping and for travel and for all these different yeah. things. Back in the day before the age of the internet and everything else that now we have all of that. So I started off actually as a phone rep and started off doing that. But the fascinating thing for me was, as I look back on those opportunities, you know, there's, there's an expression that Steve Jobs has that, God rest him, is that you cannot connect the dots unless you look backwards. You can't really connect them looking forward. You can say all you want that I want to go here, there, or there, but life has its way of taking you where you need to be. So connecting the dots backwards, that position being on the phones forced me to improve my English and my communication skills, my ability to really um, be more in a service and sales environment, be able to support clients one-on-one, to really listen to what people were saying. Because you couldn't really see them. All you could do is hear them. Mm -hmm. And being able to recognize the cues and for the first time in my life, in my career, I was in an environment where the company was really investing in its people. So I didn't leave any opportunity to get certified, to get licensed, to get um, any sort of furthering my education and my growth. Well, in the first three months I was there, I had very, very good success, Uh, whether it's because the way that I approached things, maybe a little bit differently than others, maybe because I was willing to listen. but an opportunity came up for a supervisory role. 
And uh, everybody around me says, yeah, they're never going to hire somebody who's only been here three months, man. Come on. But the thing is that people forget that when you are in your career and when you're moving from one place to the other, you're not starting from zero. You're starting from experience. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of transferable skills that I brought to the table. And so I interviewed, and to everybody's surprise, I got the supervisory job. And so now I'm a leader of a team. I'm not just a high performer, but I'm a leader of high performers, and I'm trying to create that high-performing team. Mm -hmm. And then another eight months later came by, and then an opportunity for a training executive came up, somebody who was going to oversee the training functions in a dozen call centers. Mm -hmm. Again, people around me, naysayers, crabs in a bucket. We call that now collusion of mass mediocrity. We're trying to bring me down, saying, ah, come on, man. Nobody's going to accept you there. You don't have the skills. You haven't been around here long enough. You just got promoted. Well, I applied for the job, and because of my background, because of what they saw in me, they gave me the chance. And so now I'm overseeing the training departments for 12 different call centers, mm -hmm. having you know, contact center directors being my, my clients, serving with them, working with corporate. And my career took off from there. So over the next few years, basically, I got to that point where I went from somebody at an entry level who rode the wave of the company growing. This is the company that became 100,000 employers, spread over 100 countries in the world in the wow. time of mergers and acquisitions in the late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. And then ultimately, I came to the point where through my certifications, through the investment that they made in me, I was paying the company back in spades. And so... <clears throat> at some point they had prepared me i went through my six sigma training my green belt my black belt and they basically had me working as an in-house consultant so it was one of those things where you know thursday i would get a call and it would be you know monday you're in london okay what's the problem we don't know it involves people go fix it and it was one of those kind of things where people would say go fix the problem if it involves people process organizational setup go fix it and so I developed my expertise, cutting my teeth in a situation, even in the business division that I supported, we had 14 different operating companies. You can't buy that kind of experience. Right. And so many of the things that some of my other counterparts learned through working for, you know, the big four consulting firms at the time, whether it was Accenture now, Anderson back then, you know, McKinsey and co, um, many of the others, you know, all of those big companies were basically having their people do the same thing. I just happened to be in-house. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you can show as a consultant, an in-house consultant that has to prove himself that much more, that you are making a difference in the millions of dollars for your company, millions, and hard dollar savings, mm -hmm. that's a great way to be able to develop the kind of resume and the kind of experience that then you can take forward. But inevitably, you know, now we're talking post 9-11, the travel industry has taken a hit. It's been in one of those situations where now the environment has changed. Things are starting to shut down. It's post Enron where the Wall Street markets were not willing to have companies that were too big to fail. And so this behemoth basically had to be segmented and it was broken off into four different companies. One was the Wingate, what, well, not Wingate, but the, um, the big hotel groups that basically mm -hmm. had all of the different brands, eight or nine, 10 brands. Then it was the car rental company, the Avis Budget Group. Then it was a lot of the travel distribution that had not only the, the travel membership groups, but it also had the online reservations at the time and other factors. And then they had a real estate branch, you know, Century 21, Coldwell Bankers. I mean, these are big, big major brands that everybody yeah. knows. And so all of that kind of dispersed. And at the time, you know, we got to the mid, you know, the first 2005 and all of a sudden, you know, we're at a point where I had a conversation with my boss and she says, look, everybody's either moving to Jersey or we have to let them go because we're restructuring. And, you know, in talking with my wife, we weren't prepared to move to Jersey as beautiful as it may be in certain places. That's not where we were. We still have family here. That wasn't the right thing. And I'd already spent, you know, quite a few years with the company. And I figured it was time for a change. And so then I just took my all of that experience and everything else and started working for what I consider a 30-year-old startup, a company that in, the, in the hospitality and, and restaurant sector that has multiple brands, multiple vertical, verticals throughout North America. It's the old Chicago rock bottom chop house brands that may be in many of your locations as well. And at the time, you know, it was still privately held and it was a company that had 
people there, the tenure was amazing. My boss was basically the original hostess in the first restaurant. The SVP of the brand was the first kitchen manager. Wow. So these were people that grew up and built the brand from scratch. And so there was so much to learn from them. And being able to bring a lot of the discipline and the structure and the methodologies from my corporate days, from working from a Fortune 100 company into an environment where this company was growing by leaps and bounds and had about 200 units throughout North America, mostly corporate, but also starting to franchise. Yeah. You know, there's a lot to learn there and help them. So that's where I stepped in and started building all of the leadership development programs, um, really enhanced the corporate university, built for the first time succession planning methodologies and techniques to really be able to, to spot and develop all of the top talent that we had hidden in our ranks. And so that, for another, you know, eight, six years or so, seven years became my next thing. But again, life has other plans. You know, remember that little thing that happened in 2000, what was it, 2008 with that great recession that we talked about that <laughs> shut yeah. down? Well, guess what that did to restaurant companies? So yeah. so at the time, you know, we we, we bootstrapped it. We, we, you know, pulled up our, our sleeves and we all dug in there and we made it through. So through the work that we were doing there, we were able to kind of keep, you know, the loan sharks and the bankers at bay and got through that. And we made it all the way to 2011. And at that point, again, the senior leadership team, the founders of the company, were getting up there. I mean, they were probably, most of them were in their eighth decade of life. So they were like, okay, at some point, we got to call it good. And so they decided to put the company up for sale. It got bought up by a hedge fund out of New York. Mm -hmm. And along with some other purchases that they did, they made some other mergers and machinations. And all of a sudden, most of us here at the corporate offices found ourselves reorged through no fault of our own. Mm -hmm. And so that's when, you know, I got into this last chapter of my life, basically, where I became an accidental entrepreneur, my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, man, lots unpacked. We got a few comments. I'm going to go back and, and circle yeah. back to you. Dan Bigger says, you mean people actually talk to each other on the phone? <laughs> yes, Dan, back in prehistoric times, people actually did yeah. speak on the phone. Cleo, good morning. Happy hey, Monday Cleo. to you. Dave says, what an incredible story. Eric Some has a Dave. comment here. Eric, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. A wise man once told me you should listen twice as hard as you speak. I guess that's why we have two ears, uh, one, one mouth. mouth. Yeah. And all right, is anyone keeping track of those mic, mic drops? I lost count, Dave. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I should, you know what? I should get like a little marker and like, you know, tag them as we go along. Dan Bigger says, hey, 2007 killed the company I worked for. And Yvonne yeah. says, good leadership create great followers to reach their goals. Let's yep. keep this party rolling, Con. So you decide to plant your own flag. You get, you're the, I love that. You're the accidental entrepreneur, Fresh Biz Solutions. Again, if you guys are just joining us, man, we're here with Coach Con. This is, all right, this is what we've been waiting for because now we're going to dive in. Now Masterclass yeah. starts <laughs> right now. So Con, let's dive in. You have a new, you, so dude, I was with you when you wrote your first book. I believe it was yep. your first book, right? Yep. Seven keys to navigating a crisis. So you talk about like, Hey, that little thing that happened in 2008. <laughs> well, apparently a little something happened in 2020. I'm not sure. Yep. Right. Yep. This little thing that kind of impact everybody in the world. Yes. Yeah. That's, absolutely. So, all right. So you have, you're working on your second book called the engagement blueprint. Mm. Con, let's go there. What are some, you know, without giving away the secret sauce, our friends in the crowd here, they need to go out and buy your book. And mm. by the way, guys out there, thank you for joining us. Drop a note in the chat box. Let us know that you're out there. This is yeah. a great opportunity to connect with each other. It is, I'll tell you, there are just top notch people here today, connect with each other. And I really encourage you. I invite you, welcome you connect with our dear friend, coach Khan. You're going to thank us later for that one. Con, let's dive in. Let's start giving us a little little leadership lesson, a little leadership masterclass. What are some things, you know, we target a lot of smaller uh, companies, manufacturers, mm -hmm. small entrepreneurs. What are some leadership tips that you would like to share with some of the folks here today? Okay, so let's kind of bring it to, to the content now of the new book. So let's connect the threads a little bit, if yeah, I may. Please. So when I wrote the first book, I wrote it with my dear friend, Dr. Ilya Gugouris. And at the time in 2020, in mid-March, as you remember, everything shut down. And we had a lot of questions about what the hell's going to happen next. Right. So when you do the kind of work that I do, where I, I speak for a living, I present for a living, I consult for a living, and everything is shut down, you don't know what your next 
checks going to come from? I mean, everybody was canceling because they didn't yeah. know what was doing. Everybody was being sent home. Mm -hmm. And that's when we wrote the first book in span of 45 days. Why? Because we needed to get that message out. We needed to help people. So the seven keys to navigating a crisis, it is a basically a field guide, a blueprint, if you will, a roadmap to help people deal with the unexpected change in their life. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes it's the crisis that you have. It's called a pandemic. Sometimes it's losing your job. Sometimes it's a change, you know, you, you, you a divorce, whatever it is, yeah. things happen in our lives that we don't expect, we don't plan for, but how do you handle it? So that itself was a roadmap. Now, I spent the next two years working with my clients, either coaching them individually and how to deal with things individually. But then the second year, you know, we're not, by now we're talking about 2022 mm -hmm. and we're two years past that original piece and the world has changed. And now they're asking me, what do I do next? How do I now take my team and help my team from that? So we took the same seven keys and expanded them to the organizational level and helped now organizations and leaders of teams do that. But now we're in 2023. So already I'm getting the questions, what's next? We're tired of this thing. We need to start moving beyond that. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Where do we go from here? Well, while everybody was focused on the big headlines that said another 50 million people quit their jobs in the great resignation, I'm looking at it because my job is to look below that, below the headlines, into the source, into the root cause of things. And so I'm tracking the results. And for the first time, in over a decade, the employee engagement numbers take a turn for the worse. They're going down instead of up. In the U.S., we had a steady incline of the engagement numbers. People were getting more and more engaged with work. And now for all of a sudden, even though superficially it seemed like things were okay, when you dug a little bit deeper in the trends and the numbers and the data, you could see that things were changing. And not just that engagement was no longer growing, but instead was going down. For the first time, now we're seeing a spike in disengagement, in people that are actually disengaged and sabotaging things. Mm -hmm. So think about it this way. When I tell people, okay, let's take global numbers because we have people that are across the globe right here. In Gallup studies, they say basically that you have one in five, about 20%, 21% of your people are engaged in work, which means they are there, they're giving their best. That discretionary effort that they're giving they are committing to you, their heart, their mind, their soul. They're working. They're the ones that are asked the questions, looking for how to make things better, leading events, stepping up to the plate. Then if you're in a boat, that's the person that's rowing like crazy. There are another three people that are just along for the ride. They're floating down river. Every now and again, they'll dip their paddle in. They'll help a little bit. They'll do something. But for the most part, they're collecting a paycheck and kind of enjoying the ride. And then you have that one person that one disengaged, that 19%, the one in five, that's in the back of the boat poking holes in your boat trying to sink that thing because they are pissed off at you, at their environment, because their needs are not getting met. And by golly, if they're not happy, nobody's going to be happy. They're spreading the poison, the cancer throughout your organization. They're the ones that are constantly bowed mouthing it. It's us and them. Look at how they're treating us. This is bullshit. Let's go somewhere else. I can't believe that my friend went there and they treat him so much. These are the people that are spreading that poison in your organization. Mm -hmm. And for even small operations, I mean, I, I did some back of the napkin math, if I will, Kurt. Mm -hmm. When these studies come out and say, you know what? It's about a third of the annual salary of a person, 34,000 for every 10,000 you pay somebody is lost productivity for these disengaged people. Let's do simple math here. Back of the mat, mat, napkin math that I did here on my notepad while I was waiting. Let's assume that an average worker at an entry level or somewhere on a basic level, let's say $30,000 annually, right? If that's $30,000 annually, the amount of lost productivity per worker is about $10,000 for your company. Now, let's say that your company, let's say it's a medium-sized operation that has maybe 100 workers that on average make 30000 a year. That $10,000 in lost productivity per disengaged employee, if it's 19%, is $190,000. You tell me, if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, and you're bleeding $190,000 a year, are you going to pay attention to that or not? That That's a staggering number. Kyle. It is. It is. It, 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 it kind of like just hits you right in the face, right? Yeah, and these are just averages, Kurt. These are just in average. most cases, it'll be higher than that. 
So the need to write a book about how do we solve that problem for leaders? Because to me, there's books out there that talk about engagement and mindfulness and finding happiness at work. I wrote it from the perspective of, as a leader, what can you do to build the kind of culture, the kind of environment that's going to foster that level of commitment that you need from people mm -hmm. and the level of performance that you need to be competitive? If you're going to win today, you need as many of those people on your side as possible. All right. Dave Chrysler, that was like drop the mic number 11, I think. Right yeah. So, <laughs> hey, a couple comments here, Con. Dan Bigger has your original book. I have your, yep. I bought your original yep. book and read it. Absolutely loved it. Yep. I have it on, uh, have it on my Kindle. Patrick has a question here. I haven't mm -hmm. read it yet. So I'm going to read out loud for folks. Damon, for our friends, I'm catching this on podcast later on yep. audio. Um, yep. They can't see it. So I'm going to read it. Has there ever been a moment in the beginning of your career when you were in doubt of what you were doing or was the need to hustle simply bigger and you had to bite on your lips and then realize that by dealing different with the customers than most because of actually listening would open up the first door. Mm. How do you like that question, Con? Wow. That's an interesting one to unpack. Um, there's an expression I think most of us are familiar with. It's called necessity is a mother of invention. Mm. Okay. And so... Yeah. When you don't have a choice, you have to forge on. Um, you know, Homer, when he wrote the Trojan, but the story about the Trojan War, um, the Iliad, he talked about how the Greeks landed outside on the coast of Troy and burnt their ships. Their leaders burnt their ships in order to take away the excuses. When you have no excuse or no fallback plan, you have to move forward. You don't have a choice. For me, in many cases, and I'll take probably the most recent example. Um, I mentioned to you when I got reorged out of my job in 2011, late 2011, um, that summer I lost my mother. Mm -hmm. So I had been through a series of interviews where people have looked at me. They said, you know, we love your background. We love your story. We love your personality or what we think you can bring to the table, but we don't think we can afford you, which is another way of saying ageism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so I was without a job running out of my severance package. Um, and I lost my mom. So I had an opportunity flying back from Greece that summer. Mm -hmm. And on the spur of a moment, you know, I listened to this little voice inside me that prompted me to make a call to somebody that, uh, I had actually interviewed with. And this was one of the few people that I actually believed him when he said, I really want to work with you, but I just can't afford you because, a year from now, uh, somebody's going to come back and offer you what you're really worth, and I'll be back looking for your position, to fill your position. But I really want to work with you. So I picked up the phone and called him. And that was the start of a relationship with him where he was willing to pay me as a consultant, and that launched my business. I went to the first contract I won, mm -hmm. and it kept me almost full-time busy helping them. Um, it was a community college, and I helped uh, oversee two of their grant-funded projects, building a process that then they could use to manage projects and manage look, that kind of work going forward and training their people so they had the skills to be able to deliver on those projects going forward. So that was my first client and that helped me launch my uh, my now basically business, Fresh Biz Solutions. Okay, awesome. Just the, the story of the accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> the... the we're going to, a little moment of silence right there. I mean, just in, in yeah. Patrick, thank guys, drop your questions. And boy, I see, I think there might be another question. Drop your questions yeah. again, connect with Khan here on LinkedIn. You, you're, you're just gonna, <laughs> the gold nuggets here yeah. are just coming left and right. Patrick, thank you for that awesome question. And I, you know, I think Khan, how you tacked it, there's so many, there's so, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm lacking my vocabulary, so many nuggets to unpack right there. You know, mm -hmm. the humility, the, uh, the persistence that you showed, and, and the belief that this person had in you to take a chance and how you guys kickstarted that relationship and how it catapulted your accidental, you know, uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneur career. Very inspiring. I want to grab a couple comments here. I haven't read these yet. Dan says the spike happened because some leaders just don't get it. They mm -hmm. don't use their teams that they hire to do their jobs. A leader doesn't always have all the answers and are scared to admit it. Uh, Yvonne has a great comment here. It's so true. I've been through this in a restaurant business mm -hmm. and I'm going to skip down to, I want to get down to David had a question here. I don't know if it should be about finding happiness in the workplace, but better said fulfillment. Mm -hmm. When people get to work, they should ask themselves the question, 
how can I be useful today? Con, any comment on that on that statement there? He's absolutely right because it's easy to misconstrue employee happiness with employee engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I've known a lot of employees that were very happy, uh, very happily going about their day, taking advantage of every opportunity they have and having a wonderful time, but really don't give them two thoughts about your client and how to move the business forward. When was mm -hmm. the last time you went into a store, coffee shop, a retail store somewhere, and there are people that are engaged and there are people that really are looking at their phones, texting their friends, they're happy as could be, talking in the back, sharing inside jokes, and not paying any attention to the customer. Yeah. So employee happiness and employee engagement are not the same. Neither is satisfaction for that matter. Mm -hmm. Employee satisfaction is also something different. I mean, a lot of times people try to measure employee satisfaction. How many people did you know during the, the great resignation when people were shifting and migrating in packs and droves that were satisfied where they were, but were still looking for whatever else was out there so they can, mm -hmm. they can pad their bank accounts and look for something else? Mm -hmm. So the fulfillment that Dave talks about is truly what we're trying to get to. Yeah. That level of fulfillment only comes when you fulfill certain parts. And I talk about it in the book. There are what I've identified as four main drivers of engagement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these four drivers of engagement, if you as a leader can satisfy those drivers of engagement, you will have people that will give you their commitment and they will work hard for you. Okay. Do we, 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 uh, I, so I want to do a spoiler alert. Con, are you going to give it, should, should we give them a sliver of, uh, one Absolutely. of those four? Let's and hear I think it. We should. I think we should. I mean, because these are not, these are not just employee engagement drivers. Mm -hmm. These are human engagement drivers. They apply to your kids. They apply to yeah. your partner. They apply to your neighbor. They apply to everybody around us because they speak to our human nature. Mm -hmm. So, this is the point where I invite people to take out a piece of paper and write it down because it's very simple. And guess what? It's not about the money. Mm -hmm. So the first key driver that we all seek to satisfy is the need to feel valued. We all want to feel valued. We all strive for that. So from that perspective, how do you make people feel valued? Well, you make sure that you appreciate them. You, you say thank you. A thank you goes so far. You create an environment where people feel safe, safe to express themselves, f f safe to voice their opinion about things, safe to come up with ideas, and even physically safe. I mean, the physical, mental, emotional, psychological safety is paramount. You don't have that. You don't have a business. People know, but nobody wants to go into an environment where they get abused or threatened every day. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can't do that, you're not even going to talk about engagement. You're talking about survival at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So safety, acceptance, people want to know that they're accepted for who they are. They bring themselves to work. So that's a big part of feeling valued. People want to feel respected. And in the book, I talk about two different kinds of respect. Mm -hmm. There is owed respect that we have for each other because we're human beings, we're professionals, we're people. That comes naturally. That's automatic. That should be a given. You don't go around disrespecting people. Mm -hmm. Nobody's better than anybody else. Just because you have a title doesn't make you better than anybody else. So the old respect that we have each other. But then you can add on to that the earned respect. The respect that you get because you perform well, because you're contributing to the team, because you're doing those things. That needs to be acknowledged and appreciated. And ultimately, that gratitude, appreciation, and attention. How many times have you sat down with a leader, your supervisor, and all he or she can do is look at their computer or their phone or their tablet or something else, and you feel like an afterthought? That's not making mm -hmm. people feel valued. So help people feel valued. Do the simple things that will help people feel valued. Tell them. Don't assume that they know. Show it to them through your actions because that will ma matter even more than your words. So feeling valued is the starting point, Kurt. Mm -hmm. But that's not where it ends because from there you can transition then into feeling connected. We all want to feel connected. We want to feel connected to our teammates. We all want to feel connected to the organization that we work with. We want to feel connected to our goals and how they fulfill the organization's goals. I mean, I'll give you a simple example. Take it outside of the work realm. For anybody that's volunteered their time and worked with a volunteer group, you see that passion that people bring to that cause, and it has nothing to do with money. Because they're not getting paid. They're volunteering. But they work twice as hard than if they were getting paid. 
because mm-hmm. their heart's in it. They're committed to it. They're connected to the cause. Look at the last time you guys went to a sporting event with the people around you. You're connected to them because they're wearing the same damn jersey you are, and they're supporting the same cause and group and team you are. How much connected do you feel there? You see a friend that you grew up with, or you see somebody that went to the same school that you did. Automatic connection. So help people connect. The more connected they are to your team, to you, to the organization, to the goals, the more they're going to give from themselves, the more they're going to stay around and fight through things. And then let's take it to the next piece, which is people want to feel that they're contributing. So they have a need to feel productive. People want to feel productive. They want to feel like the time that I'm putting into this amounts to something. If you feel like no matter what you do, it's not going to make a difference, are you really going to work that hard? No, you don't care. You look around and you see people that are depressed saying, well, what difference does it make? I'm beaten down. I got nothing to offer. It's not going to change anything. I'm just here to collect a paycheck. But when you can show people how they can be productive, how they can make a difference, how they fit into the bigger picture, how their simple job, that widget that they produce, fits into the bigger piece. I mean, I interviewed people from all walks of life, leaders that I have tremendous respect for, that have a global footprint or work in a very unique situation. And this is part of what they all said. You know, when people can understand how they contribute, they can see that connection. You can connect the dots with them. They will give you their best. And then ultimately, that fourth driver is that people need to feel supported so they can learn and grow. Stagnation is not a good thing. Water is is a life force. But the difference between a swamp and a river is the flow. When you look at things and you see their stagnation, a swamp is not the kind of energy that you want. You want that flowing river that's going to continuously create that pipeline of talent, that growth, that, that, that forward motion that you want in your organization. So when people understand that even this thing, this simple thing that you're asking me to do has a purpose for it, it's going to help me in some way. Remember the example that I gave you? Being on the phone helped me understand and listen to people better. Every little piece that we do, when you are in the moment, when you look at that and you as a leader can connect the dots for people and show them, I'm asking you to do this, not because it's too good for me to do, or I'm too good for to do this, and this is something you should be doing as my subject. No, I'm asking you to do this because this is part of your growth, part of your ability to grow and learn. You need to master this to move to that next level because you and I are partnering to get you there. Even for those mature workers that you have that are well-positioned, Kurt, Damon, you've seen those people that are around organizations that are well-positioned. They're happy in what they're doing. They're satisfied. They have no intention of going further. Even with those people, they can still continue to learn and grow in other ways. Maybe they can become the next mentor. Maybe they can become that specialist. Or maybe you can put it in in an area, an adjunct to where they are, to kind of challenge them a little bit differently. Yeah. But you you have to challenge them. You have to continue to help these people go. So help people feel valued, help them feel connected, help them feel productive, and help them feel supported so they can learn and grow. You hit those markers you're going to have an engaged, high-performing team. <laughs> Dude, you know that we're going to be was a master class. I want to go back, and uh, Patrick says, thank you so much. Very <laughs> inspiring. Dan Bigger says, my neck is hurting from shaking my head yeah. so much. It's yeah. good to be surrounded uh, with people that do indeed get it. So this is uh, – oh, my gosh – uh, Dan's got another comment. You're nailing it. Coach Khan. This is all about leadership, coaching others. Hey, yeah. Brian Fleming's out there. How does leadership change with a remote team versus one in an office? Great comment. Yeah, I, think great I saw on LinkedIn that, uh, 35%. Did you see that, that comment, that headline, Damon? It's, I think 35% of people remote are more likely to be, uh, uh let go or downsized than right. now. So, Con, what do you think about Brian, our dear friend Brian's uh, question? How does leadership change with a remote team versus one in an office? So here's a little bit more insight into this. To me, as a leader, we need to involve, evolve. Um, yep. For many, many years, um, it's been very stagnant. 
Um, I work a lot, not just with executives, but I work a lot with emerging leaders, those people that are kind of in those middle ranks that are still struggling to find their purpose and identity. I mean, when you think about it, even during the COVID days when everybody was automatically thrust remotely, what we found is when they measured engagement after that, the group that dropped engagement the most was healthcare workers because they got fried, they got burned out. Yeah. The second most uh, largest drop in engagement was from managers. The title, the group of managers, and they typically refer to people that are kind of in those middle ranks. Mm -hmm. Why? When, when you are a manager and you come from a background, and typically a lot of that was from a production environment where you're managing, you're overseeing a lot of blue collar workers that have a very, very clear and specific production goals. I mean, you look at our environment here that we're talking about with, with, with manufacturing, Kurt and Damon, you know better than I do. It's easier to measure how many widgets that I produce today. That's something that I can measure. I can, I can look at that. So managers, it's very easy to say, did you hit the mark or not? But when now when you are looking at those people that are remote or in a hybrid environment, most of them are not your blue collar workers or people that have to work with their hands to produce something. These are mostly white collar workers that operate in a very different kind of an office environment, only their office is somewhere in their home, right? Well, managers that have not evolved or have not taken the time to understand that are struggling now because I can no longer see you. I don't know if you're producing. How am I going to measure your productivity? Yeah. By how many emails you read or how many hours you were in a meeting or behind the computer? You can't do that because the kind of work that we're talking about requires different approach to things. When you're in a creative place, when you have to spend time problem solving, thinking, or being creative about solutioning things, you can't put a, 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 a tangible piece on that. I may have spent five hours to come up with a five-minute solution. So doing mm -hmm. that and trying to manage them with the old yardstick is ineffective. So now it's what I call the leadership paradox. The leadership paradox is when you have to bring two seemingly opposite concepts in leadership and synthesize them in such a way that now you evolve the way that you manage things. So I'll give you an example. If I have somebody that's working from home, right? I can't change the fact that they are in an environment where maybe they have a young child, maybe they have an elderly parent, maybe they have a distraction here or there. I can't manage them the same way that if I had somebody sitting in an office next to me. So I have to understand that I have to have empathy for their situation. I have to understand that they may give me their work product at different times, non-traditional times, right? Especially if the work is asynchronous, meaning that it can be done in isolation without the, the collaboration of others. They can do it at any time. It's self-paced. Mm -hmm. I have to manage them very differently. So I have to, first of all, understand their situation. Not everybody is blessed to have a dedicated office space and a nanny to watch their kids. Yeah. So... We have to be empathetic to that. At the other side of that, we have to have tough love. We have to show them that there are clear boundaries and expectations about what I need mm -hmm. and to protect them as much as the organization from that. So empathy, tough love can be synthesized to produce one paradox, right? Mm -hmm. Another one could be, I need to manage outcomes probably more than outputs. If I'm measuring widgets, I'm measuring outputs. If I'm measuring results, did you get the job done? I'm measuring outcomes. So for a lot of these white collar workers, I have to focus on the outcomes with some indicators of outputs. Does that make sense? Okay. But that requires me as a leader to really break down the job and understand what can I reasonably expect from that person in this amount of time or how long should it take them to do that? Or what are my expectations? Have I communicated that very, very clearly? All of these things require a much more sophisticated and engaged way of managing people. You can no longer do that when you are a lazy mid-level manager that's just fat, dumb, and happy and sitting there yeah. collecting a paycheck. You have to work for that. Yep. You have to look at that and say, you know what? I'm going to use high tech to create high touch. I can't see you, but we can slack back and forth whenever you need me. I can set up one-on-one -on -one meetings for us to do exactly what we're doing. The three of us are an opposite. I mean, we are in very different points of the compass here. Yet we are sitting here in the same virtual room mm -hmm. being able to engage in a meaningful conversation, a very powerful conversation. Yeah. You have to recreate those moments because I can't see you, Kurt. Those five minutes that you and I walked out of the meeting room and down to the break room where I catch up and connect with you and I say, hey, Kurt, how was your weekend? How's right. the family doing? What's going on? Right. 
that moment I have to recreate using the technology. But again, that creates a need for you to be very purposeful. So embrace that paradox and elevate your game because you know what? On the other side of that, there is a world of talent out there that you could bring onto your team. I mean, look at our friend Dan Bigger who's out here. He is in a beautiful part of this country working in a yeah. place where there's no immediate employer within a walking distance of his home. Yeah. He chooses to live here, but he could be contributing so much to any organization yeah. with his knowledge that was willing to help him and support him that way. Yeah. How many talent are you losing because they choose to work and live a certain way? Mm -hmm. This just gets me, man, because I am just I, – I fight it so much because people do not understand that that person could be across the country, across the globe – they could be your superstar if you do it right. And yep. we are missing out on so much because we're sitting here today still thinking, well, they have to come in the office. Right. It's like, why? Why? Mm -hmm. I can get better. If 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 my talent pool in, in that geography where I can actually have somebody come in the office is poor, why do I put up with that? Right. There is no absolute reason. The only reason why you insist on that is because it's easier for you. It's <laughs> honestly, I'm, that, I'm that, just, that, that's, just that, that's a moment of silence right there. Yes, that it's easier for you, right. <laughs> like that. That all right, Con. Let's, <laughs> I know this was phenomenal. This yeah. was like a 20 out of 10. <laughs> I want to recap a couple things, right? You know, a couple. So, first off, thank you, anybody out there, please like catch the share this. Catch the rewind button. Go back and like just play this. I'm gonna like I'm I I I'm gonna listen to this over and over. You don't want to be the swamp compared to the river. That is just pure gold right there. You, you, Con, I'm not gonna repeat them. You need to go out and get Con's book. He laid out the four tips, the four steps, the four strategies for you to be a rock star leader. We've got a new book coming out from Dr. from, from uh, Coach Khan, The Engagement Blueprint. It's going to be coming out in February. Khan, let's again, I like dude, I could keep you for I I told you before we went live we're going to go 4 or 5 hours and I know yeah. that we could, right? <laughs> Khan, let's go here. Any parting thoughts, words of wisdom that you want to share with folks about, you know, boy, Khan, you really got me fired up. You got me juiced. Any last parting thoughts that you want to share with folks? Let me let me kind of finish up with these, this this kind of statement here. I mean, culture culture is the way we do things. If you don't like the culture, change the way you do things. It's as simple as that. And when you have people around you that are constantly looking and saying, well, you know what, maybe I should go here or do that, or even if you're thinking that yourself, understand that the grass is not always greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. Pay attention to it cultivate it, do the things that you need to do, and your garden will blossom. The grass will be green right where you're standing. You don't have to go find it somewhere else. Make it happen for you. If you're the leader, make it happen with your team. Bring them on board. Invite them to partner with you to create the kind of place that you all want to be a part of. Drop the mic number. I lost track. I don't know how many. I have, I'm 55 years old. I have never heard that, that quote before. The grass is greener where you water it, man. I, I guys, if there was nothing else today, just getting that one right there was pure gold con. This was just an absolute masterclass. I cannot express my thanks, my gratitude, my respect, yeah. my admiration, my boy, you name it, boy, you just, you are, I, and I'm, I'm, you are a blessing. I feel iron sharp sharpens iron. Dude, from the day I met you, I feel like you just make everybody around you a better person. You're an amazing father. You're an amazing husband. I just, I, dude, I love you. I just, you are just, yeah. I love that you're in, I love that you and I cross paths. Thanks my buddy, Damon. Damon, thank yeah. you for making this relationship happen. Damon, takeaways, your thoughts for today. Just thank you, as as Kurt said, and and like like usual, I've got two or three pages of notes just from talking with you again, <laughs> Coach. And, and uh, you know, we didn't even get to talk about, and we'll have to have you back to talk about your your work with the uh, the ladies soccer and and uh, yeah. just your other stuff, which is just so cool as well. Um, but 
yeah, we get get your book out and get going. I'm just excited to to read it. I'm excited to talk about it again with you and see how it's how it's been helping people. But just thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today because it, oh. it like Kurt said, it always is just so enjoyable. Thank you. Well, thank you. And and you know, as a as a special thank you, not just to you guys, but to our audience as well, those that are gonna be listening to us even after the fact. What I'd like to do is I'm gonna go back in the comments afterwards and answer any questions that people have, but also I'm gonna put a link up in there. Um, right now, I have an online assessment that people can take um, to kind of qualitatively, from their perspective, see where their team has strengths and what drivers they need to focus on beyond that to kind of get there. It'll also be an invitation to kind of jo join our growing community, our VIP community that's going to be getting a lot of these nuggets, a lot of this information on an ongoing basis, and be able to have a heads up on um, special offers regarding the book, additional interviews, long, full-length stuff with the people that I need nice. for the book, but also kind of get a heads up of when the book's coming out, be part of the journey. I invite them not just to consume, but to contribute, my friend. Yes. Absolutely. Hey, and how about one last comment here from Dan Bigger? I enjoyed this. Nice job, gentlemen. And and says, Thanks, uh, Dan. Coach Khan is the man. Simple <laughs> is always better. Just as bigger is always better. So there you go. All right, guys, we're gonna close things out. Man, I I I could have. I probably had twenty more questions for you, Khan. So yeah, we're we definitely we'll have to do this have, again, my friend. Dude, when the, after the book comes out, we need to have you back on. And so again sending our, uh, just wishing you tremendous success with the book and Thank just you. love the impact that you're having on yeah. thousands of lives and just the change that you're making. You know, and there's a lot of bad things going on on the planet. And it's just, you know, it's wonderful having conversations like this and just seeing a dude like you yeah on how you're just making the, the world a better place. Patrick says, thank you so much for this interview. Patrick, thank you for joining us today. Again, guys, go back. Please replay this. Share it with folks. Hit the rewind button. Just yeah. This was pure, pure gold. Go out and just be someone's inspiration, man, just like yeah. Coach Khan. And Damon, hey, you know what? We've been hanging out for over an hour. How about a big round of applause here for Coach Khan, guys? Everybody give a big roaring ovation for our Coach Khan Con, hang out with us for one second. We're going to close things out. Damon, we're going to be live in Austin, Texas this week. I'm not sure the yeah. date time, but we're going to be live coming to you from Austin, Texas. It's going to be great. We will keep you posted there. So, guys, God bless you. Have an awesome, amazing, incredible day. And, man, this was good. Thank you, Con. Thank Thanks, you, Con. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Oh, my God.